Good morning, Kelvin. Nice article today, um, Joseph, about Maisie and J1. I like that one. Thank you. I appreciate it, Coach. Uh, Coach uh, Jamal was just named first team All American by the Associated Press. Uh, thoughts on yet another award for your for your point guard? Well, Marcus Sasser was the Jerry West um, top shooting guard in the nation uh, last year. And uh, Mark uh, Jamal coming back and uh, being named first team All American. Uh, I, I think it speaks to their, um, how serious they take work. You know, uh, Jamal, like, um, very similar to Marcus, neither one of these kids were highly recruited out of uh, high school. Um, you know, they, they kind of, they both kind of embody what we um, stand for, you know, player development, uh, recruiting kids that want to get better. They, they come from good stock. They're, they have high character. They're tough. Uh, they're smart. Um, and they're, and they're willing to put winning ahead of statistics. You know, if you, you know, if you judge those all American awards on statistics, our guys wouldn't win very many, but, uh, the winning, you know, we, you know, and you're not making those, you're not making those teams unless you're playing on a winning team. So Jamal's a winner. He's tough. Um, uh, he's a hard worker, and he's a uh, uh, terrific leader and a great young man. Really, really, really proud of him. Thank you, Joseph. We'll go to Christy Reekin with the Associated Press. Christy, go ahead with your question for Coach Sampson, please. Coach, to follow up about Jamal, um, would you be able to reflect on his journey at U of H and how far he's come in his time with you and what he's meant to your program overall? Well, when he came in, uh, Christy, um, I thought he was a long way away. Um, I thought his his immaturity was an issue. Um, his day-to-day -day practice habits uh, were an issue. Um, and he, and he was, his freshman year, he was on a Final Four team. Uh, and that helped him, that we didn't need him his freshman year. We didn't recruit him to play his uh, freshman year. Um, and I think the thing that really helped us was his mother and father. You know, he didn't have anybody to, to, to call home and cry to or to listen to excuses. That that was out, that was never going to be an issue. His, his mom and dad are, are unusual in that um, uh, they say the coach is always right. Um, they, they knew he needed... Um, the culture that we've we've established here, but uh, he struggled. He struggled uh, all the way up. I would say until after Christmas, uh, so somewhere around January of his freshman year, it started kicking in. But I think that's because of Marcus and Quentin Grimes and Dejan Giroux and Fabian and um, um, Justin Gorham, Bryson Gresham. We had a lot of older, mature guys that had been in this system all for two or three years, and they knew how to get through the times that he was going through and come out on the other end and look like this. So he he, he had he had great uh, role models around him every day. But around February, going into March, he started giving it back to them. He started kicking their butts in practice some days, not every day. I mean, you know, uh, he was playing – he was playing behind two kids that were both first round NBA draft choices and Jay John's Rose playing for the Memphis Grizzlies right now. So that entire backcourt was, uh, is in the NBA now. Um, but learning from those guys, how they handle things, uh, Marcus's seriousness, uh, 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 Quentin's professionalism, he needed to see that. And, and, I think our pro I think our program raised that kid from being a uh, a kid to being a man. And this is the end result. And I think I think it's a great story, uh, Christy, in that when things were really tough for him, he didn't quit. He didn't transfer. 
uh, he wasn't looking for a reason to leave. And I, and I thank his mother and father for that. Cause I, I was tough on Jamal, but he needed that. And um, now that he's, he went through that his sophomore year, he was a starter uh, on an elite eight team last year, a start on a final, uh, um, I'm sorry, sweet 16 team. Now he's a st starter and player of the year in the big 12 and uh, started for the uh, uh, big 12 champions. And he's a great story um, of perseverance and um, overcoming a lot of adversity. Uh, he, he's, he had a lot of adversity and most of his adversity was uh, self-inflicted, but he overcame that and, and, and now one of the best leaders we've ever had. Thank you, Christy. We'll go to Greg Bailey with KTRK TV. Greg, please go ahead. Kelvin, good morning. Um, so many of your players throughout the years have talked about how special the experience is to go to the NCAA tournament to be together both on and off the floor and spend that time. What, what's special about that experience for those of us who will never know? And, and why is that such a huge part of your program? Was well, every kid's dream. Um, I think a lot of uh, Damian Dunn's a good example. You know, when he left uh, Temple, of course, he probably had 35, 40 schools from power conferences all trying to get him. And I asked him, why Houston? Why do you want to come here? He said, because I want to win. I want to go to the NCAA tournament. That's that's the dream. You know, if you play basketball at this level, you want to have a chance to play in March Madness. You want to see Greg Gumbel call your name out on Selection Sunday. You want to be sitting with your team with cameras on you and stand up and give a big group cheer and with your camera capturing that moment and being able to go through that week of preparation and, and the exhilaration of winning a game. Uh, and there's an exhilaration in losing a game that you had the opportunity uh, to play with your brothers, with the people that you fought, fought with every single day or been with every day since we got together back in June. I mean, there's a brotherhood and a closeness of going through that. Uh, and, and now, you know, we've been by ourselves basically for what? nine months with, with no, there's no pep rallies. There's nobody waiting for you outside the hotel. Nobody's sending you off on a bus. You know, we live in almost anonymity uh, uh, except for conference play. Then you get here, now you see everybody. Everything's changed, but it hasn't changed for us. We we maintain our, uh, our same routines, but we just have more people around. Uh, but for these kids, it's important that they go through that. Um, and then the last thing I would say, Greg, is uh, memories. Th these are great memories. Um, you know, the winning, the losing, time cures all that. If you lose, it, people will get over it. But you'll always have that memory of at least having had the opportunity to try uh, versus being at a place where you never get to experience this. It's just special. Um, they come to school on scholarship. Uh, they want to do well, sure. They want to... Uh, be great at it, but um, being able to get to the NCAA tournament, um, you know, is still still a, a memory that will will stay with them forever. Thank you, Greg. We'll go to Chris Gardner with the Houston Round Ball Review. Chris, please go ahead. Coach, what is Longwood style of play? I know very little about them. So, what is their style of play? Uh, very well coached. Um, they're old and they're veteran. Um, um, you know, Griff, what Griff has done there is, um, I think, special. Uh, they're they're very well put together. They've got an outstanding point guard and a napper kid. They've got another kid that can play point guard, but a good shooter, left-handed kid, and a Houston kid. Um, Granlin kid fits because he can make threes and he's, he has great size on the wing. Um, but I think the Christmas kid, the Christmas kid is a tough matchup because they play him at the four and he can make threes, so you're going to have to get out to him. Um, then there are five spots by committee. They have two starters. Uh, the Tucker kid is a starter, but the, a, a lot of nights 
the Zapala kid uh, is right, is the guy they play through, and he's seven foot. Um, and then off the bench, um, Massey, who is a, uh, you know, a keg of dynamite. You, you just never know what he's going to do, but he's a problem because he can go get, get his own shot. He's very aggressive um, and looking for a shot. He's got great size. We actually coached against him or played against him last year. He was with McNeese State. Um, and then they, um, uh, the kid that's going to be the player for them going forward, though, is this uh, Richards kid. He's he's a freshman. He's the only freshman they play. But he's a very talented kid. Um, but they're well put together. They're old. They're veteran. They're well coached. Um, um, you know, we've been watching film on them. And, you know, they're, they're hard to play, I guess, because they, they're really good at controlling the pace of the game. They're going to run their sets. They're going to run their stuff. And they execute. Uh, and then the other thing is offensive rebounding. They're they're a high level, high level uh, offensive rebounding. Um, you know, people talk about us being an offensive rebounding team. Well, we used to be, but not anymore. You know, all our best offensive rebounders are hurt, so you don't replace that. But um, uh, Longwood it, Longwood has all their guys, so they're they're uh, they're really good at it. So a lot of ways to beat you. They can make a three. They can get to the free throw line. Uh, they can get second, third shots. They got good size, but uh, their most valuable player for sure is their point guard Napper. He controls the game for them. Thank you, Chris. We'll go to Adam Spillane from Sports Radio Six Ten. Adam, please go ahead. Hey, Calvin. Um, had you ever run into Griff Aldrich when he was on the AAU circuit here? And does his team remind you of of any that you've seen this season? You know, I did run into Griff. Uh, I've talked to him a few times on the circuit, um, but it was while he was at Longwood. You know, I remember he came over and introduced himself, and we sat and had a great visit. Um, I don't remember where we were, some somewhere uh, at some event. It could have been anywhere. <laughs> but um, and then I started following his team, knowing he's from Houston, and then um, uh, they went to the NCAA tournament was it last year or year before? So I think they've gone two times in three years. Um, but you know, watching their team, they're, they're built for the postseason. Maybe, maybe not necessarily for the regular season, uh, because of how veteran they are. They, they're just steady. You know, they they're just steady. Uh, they don't have a lot of highs or lows. Um, but I think that has a lot to do with him, the way he coaches his team. Um, you can tell watching film on the team, uh, whether they're well coached or not by their discipline. And, um, uh, he's got a very disciplined team and, um, he's done a great job. Very, very, very impressed with the job he's done there. Thank you, Adam. I'm going to skip around a little bit in our order. So bear with me here for just a second. We're going to go to Bill Kaiser with the Virgin Islands daily news. Bill, if you have a question, go ahead with Coach Sampson, please. Yeah, hi, Coach. Uh, question, uh, Juwan Roberts' status for the game. Is he going to be available, or is the leg still bothering him? He'll be available. Um, how's his leg coming along? I know, you know, it's been a few days since his last game. Has he been responding to treatment, or? Yes, it, it's, it, he'll be fine. One final question. You talked about, you know, kids wanting to come to Houston to play in the NCAA tournament. But isn't this kind of a scary time of the season for not just you as coaches, but the players as well, Because especially as a number one seed, because you never know when you're going to run into that next Maryland-Baltimore County? I haven't really thought about that, Bill. I guess that's the difference in sports writers and coaches. You know, that, that really has some part of my thought process. Um, there's always a chance, but um, I prefer to look at it another way. You know, our next game is against Longwood. We're going to kind of stay with what we've done all year and prepare for our next game. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. We'll go to Chancellor Johnson with uh, KPRC-TV. Chancellor, please go ahead, sir. Hey, Kelvin, um, at least uh, a couple of times every single game, um, 
uh, LJ and Jamal get this look in semi transition where he flips it back and, and you just guys get an open look. I know you guys have been doing that um, actually for a, a few years now. I'm curious, when did that start as far as that the, the flip back play and, and transition? How often do you guys work on that? And then what does it do for your offense when you don't have to call a play? Those guys just have it down. They, they have a, a certain chemistry about each other that they know, you know, in trailing to, to kind of find each other in transition. Yeah. What are four or five different ways we can get guys looks in transition. Um, the two easiest ways though, is off offensive rebounding. Um, you know, we call them daggers when we get an offensive rebound very rarely, unless we have a clear path to a dunk, uh, we usually throw it out and move it one time or catch it, shoot it. You can usually get open threes that way. And then when a team is uh, transitioning from offense to defense, they're running back. Uh, a lot of a lot of teams get below the three point line, and when they get below the three point line, that's that's when we circle back behind the ball. And um, uh, Marcus Sasser, Armani Brooks is probably the best at it uh, that we've had. Uh, Galen and Armani had a great chemistry with that. Um, Jamal and Marcus had a great chemistry with that, and is and now. Uh, Jamal and uh, LJ have a great chemistry, but we've been doing that for a long time. And how, what was the last part? How does it help us? It gives us three more points. Thank you, Chancellor. We'll go to Adam Winkler with KTRK TV. Adam, please go ahead. Kelvin, you've kind of talked uh, about how the the committee hasn't exactly done you a ton of favors, despite the number one next to your name. But this year, unlike last year, you're going to be one of the last teams to play um, your first game as banged up as y'all are. Is that, is that an advantage? Like, is that something that you'll be able to to use those, you know, every, does every hour count at this time of the year? Well, the flip side of that is we're, we're one of the last ones to play, which means that we'll have the shortest amount of rest if we're fortunate, lucky enough to win. So different ways to look at that, but you know, in this tournament, you focus on one game, uh, they said that we're going to play at 820. Um, uh, I'm sure Coach Griff and uh, Longwood look at it the same way. So it'll be a long day. I think we'd all prefer to play earlier, but uh, I'd rather play at 820 than 11 o'clock in the morning. I, I've, I've done that a few times in Tucson, Arizona, playing 11 o'clock in the morning, 11, what, 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 1107, 1120 tip, something like that. So um no complaints we play at 820 we'll go play at 820 i don't care thank you adam we'll go to chris baldwin with paper city houston chris please go ahead hey calvin um jamal was saying he's looking forward to seeing a, a manual play you know the nta tournament after and not being nervous anymore after having had that experience last year Did, have you seen you know instances where that second bite at the pie you know, sort of makes a difference? And how have you seen Emmanuel's confidence grow? Yeah. Well, Emmanuel's role this year, um, you know, we've always tried to be loyal to our kids and develop our kids from year to year. You know, people get so enthralled with the menu. You know, somebody puts, you know, a new menu item up there, you know, people go back crazy thinking about a new player. I, I don't care about any of that. I, I like developing our guys. You know, Manuel Sharp is in his, uh, well, he's kind of in his third year, but he didn't play basketball whatsoever, uh, I think, for eight months after he got here because he has such a horrific injury. But last year he got a chance to play. And, uh, you know, he came off the bench uh, on a team that, won a conference championship and went to the Sweet 16. So he's had a ton of success and played a key role on a very successful team. And now this year, uh, same thing, uh, very successful team, but now he's a starter. Um, and I think his confidence has grown by having played uh, um, so many road games in the Big 12. You know, he's, he's played at Kansas, at TCU, at Oklahoma, uh, well, you guys all are road games. And, you know, when you go into those venues that we went in this year and had some success, 
Uh, that's where you get your confidence from. It, it motivates you to work harder uh, in practice, to spend extra time um, at night or on weekends or on days we don't practice to get in the gym and work on your craft. But your confidence comes from your preparation. We'll go back to Joseph Duarte, please. Joseph, go ahead. Kelvin, over the last 10 years, I've, I've heard you tell us about different odd jobs that you've had to supplement income or, you know, just, just what you had to do, you and Karen. Uh, I, I was wondering, what was your first, the very first job, non-basketball, and also, um, I hear you're pretty, uh, you gave instruction on, on fly fishing. I was wondering no. what makes a what makes a good fly fisher. <laughs> I may be the worst fly fisherman in the history of uh, of the rod and reel. Um, well, my grandfather was uh, I was really close to my grandfather. Um, I used to love talking to him. He was born in eighteen ninety seven. My grandmother was. My grandmother was born in 1912. My father was born in 1929, and my mom was born in 1932. Um, my grandparents on both my mother and father's side, uh, I don't think any of them got past the sixth or seventh grade. But that was a time when, you know, they worked, they worked, they had to work. My, my grandfather opened a little mom and pop grocery store before chains came in. I think my first job was bagging groceries for him after school and on weekends. Um, then I then I had a um, an old Briggs and Stratton engine lawnmower that I'd push around and ask people if I could cut their grass for two dollars. I think gas was about uh, 30 cents a gallon back then. Uh, I sold grit newspapers. Um, where did uh, cucumber markets, tobacco markets? Um, I always had a job, um, but you know, my mom and dad. My dad had a nine month contract, so he didn't have any money to give any to give to our. I had three sisters, so there's four of us. So all of us had jobs. So my, my sisters were lifeguards at a pool. Um, that they babysat. Uh, they cleaned houses. I mean, we we all worked. It wasn't just me. My my whole family was workers. My dad had four jobs every summer. He worked at the back of market. He taught drivers in. He sold Lincoln Life Insurance, and he sold World Book Encyclopedias. That's what they did to supplement his income. And uh, he was my greatest influence, along with my mother. She was a a nurse, worked twelve hour shifts. Uh, so. I came from a family of workers, and I'm just a byproduct of them. Thank you, Joseph. We have time for a couple more questions. We'll go back to Adam Winkler from KTRK TV. Adam, please go ahead. Kelvin, you made it a point to say that you know you guys are going to keep your routines, you know, even despite the NCAA tournament. But you also talk about the the memories, and tomorrow there's going to be a a send off as you guys you know, get on the bus and, and head to Memphis. Will there be a message to to the group about, you know, hey, this is different, let's enjoy this while realizing it is still a business trip? Yeah, I think the, um, you know, if it had not been for COVID, this would be our seventh consecutive NCAA tournament. Um, so we have a lot of guys every year that, that have been to numerous uh, tournaments. Um, but, you know, the guys I get most excited for is the guys that's their first time. Um, and I and I really appreciate how J1 Roberts and um, Jamal, uh, uh, the older guys that's been around, uh, how they help make it a big deal for uh, said alley. Uh, he's never seen any of this. Jacob, the only time these guys have ever seen any of this is on TV. Um, I, heard Jay, I heard Jacob say something the other day that jump, Jacob McFarlane, I heard him say something. And he was just, I just happened to be walking behind him and he was walking with Jaywan. 
and he told Jay one, he said, uh, you know, even before I started to come to school here, you were my favorite player. I remember watching you in the NCAA tournament, you know, and I, it just took me aback um, that, you know, Jacob was a highly recruited kid out of high school. I mean, he could have went to Pac-12, SEC, a uh, bunch of Mountain West, there's a bunch of schools, but his best, his favorite player was J1 Roberts. I said, that's, that's pretty cool that he would even say it. And, and, uh, and J1 was very, you know, appreciative of him uh, saying that, but, um, but that, I think that speaks to the kind of person and player J1 is, but also uh, that Jacob would be humble enough to look at one of his teammates and tell him that. So, I took that as a really cool moment. Uh, and we talked about memories a while ago. Um, I want I want these guys, uh, even even though uh, I've been to, uh, I think Joseph said last night, I've been to 19 of these things. This thir it's their first one. You know, I, I'm, you know, I'm not cold hearted to say, well, I've been, and it's not about me. I, who cares? You know, it's about these guys. This is their time. This, this is their moment. Uh, to go experience something that only 68 people get to experience. And I'm sorry, 68 teams each year. Um, so it is a big deal. I, I don't care what your seed is. It doesn't matter. Uh, you're in the NCAA tournament. We're no different than anybody else uh, as far as we're concerned. But as Bill Bill's, um, so uh, uh, the way he put it, uh, is completely different the way coaches and players look at it. It's a big deal. You know, we're, we're going to ride this train as far as we can go. Uh, uh, will we lose the game? Absolutely. You can lose the game. Anybody can lose the game in the tournament, but we're sure as hell ain't scared of it. We'll go to Randy McElvoy with KPRC TV. Randy, please go ahead. Morning, Calvin. Uh, congratulations on on the the high seed and moving on. I want to ask you. You mentioned there was a question earlier just about enjoying the experience that is the NCAA tournament. I want to follow up on that. Where if you can talk a little bit about just what these years have meant for you. You talk about family being involved in your program, Lauren, and of course, and you got Kellen right there on the bench. What what are these times like having your son right there on the bench with you and continue to watch the the development of his coaching experience just to continue to grow over all these years? Um, best time of my life, uh, Randy. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, most of the, most of the uh, guys I went to school with have been retired for a long time and they, 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 they think I'm crazy for, continuing to work why why don't you retire um, um but be, being able to experience this with uh lauren and kellen but also with Maisie and kylan and karen and tanya uh, our family you know when karen and i were young we didn't live around any of our family you know we moved from north carolina we got married in north carolina um our first year we were married uh, we were, I was in graduate school at Michigan State University in East Lansing. Then we left there and went to Montana, Washington, and you know. So we, we never had the, we were never never able to be around aunts and uncles or our mothers or fathers. So we we just never we were always by ourselves. It was just Karen and I. And then when Lauren and Kellen came along, it was just the four of us. So you know we didn't we didn't spend Christmases with grandparents or uncles or aunts. We didn't have any of that. You know, we didn't have the money to fly back to where they were. And it was those holidays that was, you know, you don't go see, uh, you know, you, my mom and dad had it for home from at home for my sisters and their families. So um, for us, it's always been Kelvin and Karen, Lauren and um, Kellen. And now, uh, you know, here on the back nine, if you will, when I look at, uh, you know, how we're, uh, where this has evolved to, it's it's still Kelvin and Karen, uh, Kellen and Lauren, and now we have Maisie and Kyla, and that's, 
And that's such a blessing. It's a, it's a godsend that, that you're in this position. It's very humbling. But, you know, there's so much gratitude and appreciation for being able to uh, finish up like this. Um, um, and that's one of the reasons why I've never really had any interest in going anywhere else, because I, I, I just love our setup. I love the fact that um, my daughter and my son and his family live, you know, 10, 10 minutes away or whatever, uh, that I can leave practice and go see my grandkids if I want to as long as they're not at gymnastics or softball or soccer or something. And even then I'll go watch them play soccer uh, or watch them kick the crap out of each other's shins, trying to miss the ball. That's kind of what that is. Um, but I, but I've, uh, but I have such great appreciation for being this and uh, I don't take it for granted and watching Lauren grow in her job and the impact she's had on the success of this program and, uh, Kellen's uh, development, um, you know, every year he gets a ton of calls about uh, different job opportunities. And, you know, sometimes he'll come and ask me about one, what I think. And um, other times he figures it out on his own, what he wants to do. But I've always encouraged them to, you know, make make their own path. Um, do, do what's best for them make their decisions independent of what anybody else thinks. Um, Cause at the end of the day, you, you know, your, your happiness is your happiness, not anybody else's. Our last question of the day, we'll go to Chancellor Johnson, please. Chancellor, go ahead. Uh, just a quick follow, follow up to Randy's question. How do you guys balance, uh, especially around this time of the year, everybody knows, uh, the, you know, these games and, and things like that. How do you guys balance the roles that each each one of you guys have respectively within the program and then just being a family and spending time with each other. Uh, um, I, I think I got the gist to your question, uh, Chancellor. Um, well, um, you know, for me, nothing changes really. Um, you know, we played 30 some games without pet rallies. You know, we've played 30 some games without uh, um, people outside the hotel. You know, usually we live a very nomadic life. We go game to game, game um, practice court to the bus, to the plane, to the hotel, to the game, back to the bus, to the plane, back home. You know, we, we do that for, you know, October, November, December, January, February, March. And because of the success our program has had, now we have a lot of people involved. But we don't change. You know, people around us have changed, but we, we're very, you know, I'm, I'm very routine driven. I'm almost superstitious uh, uh, to a fault. So how we balance anything, I don't balance anything. I just do what I've always done. 